Hello, Trombone Internet. This is Chris Van Hoff, assistant to the regional manager of the International Trombone Festival. We at the festival, of course, are huge fans of the pod, and we are really excited to invite you to attend this year's 2024 International Trombone Festival at TCU in Fort Worth, Texas. Dave Begnosh is our host. We have the world premiere of a brand new double concerto for trombone and piano with the Fort Worth Symphony. We have the American Brass Quintet. We have late night jazz featuring a Latin jam session. Like everything is happening, all the cats will be there. It's the best hang in the world, and we hope to see you there. You can register for the festival still online at www.internationaltrombonefestival.com, and it's happening the last week of May. So go register. We'll see you in Texas. Please stand clear of the doors. Welcome to the Trombone Retreat, podcast of the Third Coast Trombone Retreat. Today on the podcast, we welcome Vanessa Freilich, Associate Principal Trombonist of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. My name is Sebastian Vera, and I'm joined by my pal, Nikki Pop Schwartz. How are you doing today? Have you played your scales yet? I was playing my scales as we signed on to do this intro. Got some scales in, went to the grocery store. It's been a good morning. I, how, you, and, how, how are you doing? How are you doing? Hold on. How are you doing? In middle school, when you didn't pass your scales, they put you in scale jail. It's a place, it's a place you don't want to be, in the clink. <laughs> in the clink. <laughs> doing, doing some hard, hard time. Doing hard time for my F major. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing just fine, and we had a really fun talk with Vanessa. I like her. She's cool. She's our, our first and, and definitely not last Canadian guest. And she just had some really great wisdom and advice and also really hates Tim Horton. Yeah, well, you know, we learned some reasons why to hate Tim Horton. So um, I guess I can't blame her, but those are some delicious maple logs you can get there. So I'm torn. (laughs) (laughs) If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please subscribe. We can subscribe. You can subscribe anywhere. That you can download podcasts. We'd also like to announce our weekly Trombone Retreat live on Instagram. Thursdays at noon Eastern, Nick and I will be meeting on Instagram to talk about certain specific topics, special Q&As, in general being ridiculous. We also, for about a month now, we've been doing the daily Trombone Retreat practice hang All weekdays, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Go to trombonretreat.com slash practice. Hey, Sebastian. Hmm. I heard some news. Tell me the good news. I heard the Houghton Horns now is carrying the Joe Alessi model of shock what? trombones. Exactly. You know, I, I've been told that if you buy the, the custom Joe Alessi Shires trombone that you will inherit all of his abilities. Well, then I better buy that trombone. <laughs> Who knew? That's all you had to do. Yeah. As you might have guessed, this trombone was fully designed by Joe Alessi himself. And it embodies the perfect balance of color efficiency and resonance. And has unsoldered two-piece lightweight yellow brass bell, which enables you to effortlessly cut through any ensemble while maintaining a mature width of sound. Financing options are available through Houghton Horns, and you can also visit their showroom. For more information, visit HoughtonHorns.com. Enjoy the podcast! So how you been, Vanessa? Last time I saw you was at uh, ITF in Muncie. Yeah, in that weird auditorium, <laughs> yeah. blasting away. <laughs> do you do you do you remember being in there and there was that one girl trying bass trombones? <laughs> there was this girl trying bass trombones, and she would, if you could imagine, there's the exhibition hall. It was like in the the lobby area of of an auditorium, and then you could walk into the auditorium and try the horns. And this girl would go and pick up a bass trombone, come into the auditorium, play a note at minimum 17 fortes and be like, nah, this isn't it. And go put it back and grab another one. And Vanessa and I were trying to have a conversation and it wasn't going well because we were being covered by trombone. Well, and you wanted to listen. It was like impressive in a way. It was. It it was very loud. It was very loud. You just described why I typically avoid certain trombone events. (laughs) So what's new? (laughs) (laughs) 
Are we are we in the interview now? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it's happening. Okay. Before b- it, before it, you even realize. What have you been doing since I last saw you in 2019? I mean, besides doing nothing like the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, for a while I was doing a lot, and lately I've been doing not so much. Just before COVID happened, things were chugging along. I was uh, teaching at University of Toronto and playing with the symphony here in town and, and loving my job, and and then everything ground to a halt, and... Since then, I've done a lot of uh, canoeing and cross country skiing, which are both new things to me. And oh man, I've um, always wanted to cross country ski. It's a workout. workout. (laughs) Yes, it's like your whole body, right? Yeah, I did 14 kilometers yesterday, and it's like you sweat through so many layers. It's crazy. (laughs) Now, now, how many how many freedom miles is that? (laughs) (laughs) Freedom Um, miles. No, so okay, I always ask people this because I grew up cross country skiing. First of all, were you on? Groom trails, or were you going? Like, Yesterday back- we went to a place that has really nice groom trails. That's a lot easier. Yeah. See, I grew a up a lot on less ed- falling. Yes, <laughs> yeah, because it's hard to it's really hard to cross country ski on non groom trails. It really is. I grew up on the edge of a state park, and we would go back in there, and there were no no groom trails. And then I went, I learned that way, and then I went to a place with groom trails. It's like, oh my god, this is so easy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's fun, isn't it? I really need a lesson, but I started learning during COVID, so you can't get a lesson or <laughs> right. you can't get rentals. So you just sort of invest in the equipment and then trial and error. Is it easy to fall in cross yes. country skiing? Yes. All the time. <laughs> hey, Nick, this isn't your interview. I'm asking you. Hey, well, you're, you're talking to two people who cross country ski. In fact, I, in fact, I'm I'm going to get mine out. I swear I'm going to get them out. But the boots are a little small, so we'll see. Maybe. Let's have a cross-country ski trip like let's meet in vermont or something you, you know what's you know what's if the clear? border was open i'd be there. exactly <laughs> well first of all help me out is it frolic or fralic fralic okay do you do you say that because it's like so people just won't spell your name like frolic I think, <laughs> well i always i can't imagine having a name that comes up in regular conversation all the time like nick it must be really strange to just like, oh, I nicked my face shaving again. Oh, and you're true. always hearing your oh. own name. So I that only happens to me when people say the word finesse, and then I kind of do a double oh. take. Are you talking oh. to me? So I do find it a little strange when I hear someone well, say frolic. If, that, is that makes me think name. though, if if your name was finesse frolic, that'd be like the best <laughs> dancer name ever. <laughs> sure, we'll say dancer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've I've been following you on Instagram and seeing you do these crazy like backwoods adventures. That's, I mean, th- that's that's pretty admirable to uh, keep yourself busy doing those beautiful things during this time. You know, it, it's better than sitting and doing a Netflix binge. You know, <laughs> well, it's it's extreme social distancing. <laughs> sure, it's one of the few things that you can do that's safe right now. Um, that's permitted. I think in Ontario here, like I think our numbers at their worst, we're still, like, I think the only states that were um, doing better than us were maybe, like, Hawaii and Vermont, Um, and yet we have some of the strictest restrictions of anywhere, so, like, currently we can only have 10 musicians on stage at one time, so there's really no possibility of doing much of anything, and definitely nothing that involves trombones. Um, Unless you do, like, the Stravinsky Octet or something like that. Yeah, which... Somehow they don't seem keen to program. So, yeah, I got into kind of exploring what wilderness and nature there is around here, which turns out there's a lot. I often, I'll go and map my trips afterwards on Google Earth, and I'm expecting to see this giant route that I took, and it's the tiniest little percentage of Ontario that I've seen. Well, you just so, gotta you just gotta zoom in a lot, <laughs> a lot. Yeah, and then it looks huge. Yeah. It's so huge. Yeah. This province. I know. We'll, we'll, Speaking of speaking of some live performing, I, I want to hear about this group Horn on the Cob. <laughs> You've done I'm your research. <laughs> so my partner is a uh, horn player in the orchestra with me. And one night we were sitting and having cocktails early in the lockdown in March. And we heard brass playing coming from outside. And we're Toronto, so that's significant because it's pretty cold outside. And it sounded very close. So we got off our Zoom cocktail hang and went running out into the street to see where it was coming from. 
and they had just stopped and gone back in their house, but it turned out it was this family where the dad is an amateur trombonist. He's a playwright by trade, and his sons were in grade 8 and I think at the time 11, maybe 7 and 11 respectively, and they had just kind of by fluke brought their instruments home for March break, which is like our spring break. And one of them had ju- had been playing trombone, but had just brought home a tuba for fun. And the other one had just started learning trumpet. And so the dad decided, okay, to give these guys something to do, we're going to write a little arrangement. And instead of what most people were doing at the time, which was the 7 p.m. go out and bang pots and pans and cheer for healthcare workers, we're going to play a little song. And so I think they did a really short arrangement of the theme song for the, the A-team. And <laughs> <laughs> so we called them back out of their house and talked to them a bit. And we said, are you going to do it regularly? They said, yeah, we're going to try and do it every night. So we asked if we could join. And he said, well, do you guys play? And we're like, yeah, we play. (laughs) So so we said we were in the symphony. And they said, yeah, come anytime. And we went out the next night. And it ended up being 108 nights in a row. And between mainly the, the dad and his oldest son, a few were mine. But mostly it was theirs. They wrote a new arrangement every single night. And we ended up being joined by a couple of trumpet players that moved in across the street and then a few um, jazz players from nearby. And we never, it went a little bit viral, but we never gave the location or the street name because we wanted to keep it to just the local neighborhood and just people that happened to wander by at that time. And it kind of became a really great bonding, bringing the neighborhood together together experience and people were really appreciative and of course we were so like it really got us through that period gave us a reason to get out of our pajamas once a day at least (laughs) or at least put a coat on over them yeah (laughs) and and go down and play some music and it was pretty amazing for especially for the young the young guys in the band oh yeah uh to to read a new chart every day. I don't think there's a lot of middle schoolers that have that experience and perform it, perform it every day. So they ended up both getting pretty serious about their instruments and taking lessons. And uh, we like met a lot of people in the, we were new to the neighborhood actually. So uh, we got to meet a lot of people that we live. Now everybody knows you. Well, and now we moved away again because (laughs) the one person that did not appreciate it was our upstairs neighbor, sadly. (laughs) Oh, oh no. really? So, yeah. so that's what drove you out is you had a, an angry uh, neighbor? Yeah, she really, it wasn't just the music. She was a bit, she didn't even like that we were gardening in the backyard or that she could hear us talking. So with the instruments, it just got to the point where she was blasting heavy metal every time we tried to play and we just had to get out of there. And and what's her name? <laughs> yeah. She lives at. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's, that, that really, I hate, I hate hearing stories like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So many of them. It's it's really hard in this city because there's not a lot of, well, it's very expensive to live. So like I'm still renting and there are not a lot of single family homes. There's a lot of duplexes in Toronto. So even if you buy a whole home, it's often a semi detached for what you can afford. And so you still have to luck out with the neighbor situation in that case. Now, is it common to live like that? Or are there like a lot of like uh, mid rises, high rises, stuff like that too? I, I don't there are a lot of condos, yeah, a lot okay. of condo buildings, more and more. And it's kind of frustrating. Toronto's, like a lot of Canada, doesn't do a very good job of preserving its past. And it's very different from... That's why I loved living in St. Louis, because you still have all of these amazing buildings that from, from every era that have been mm-hmm. preserved and are still used and still cherished. And a lot of businesses that are still going from the 50s. And Toronto's just all new, all the time. Tear it down, build a condo. It's unfortunate to hear about your your neighbor because it it, it kind of confuses me because it kind of goes against my belief that all Canadians are the nicest people on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't I don't I'm trying to you know there, of course there's stereotypes that go both ways and that it's a positive stereotype but literally every Canadian I've ever known has been like over the top friendly person and I don't get it at all. Go to go but to a hockey. Masters of passive aggression. <laughs> Oh, yeah. is that what it We're is? Nice to your face. You have see. Oh. I, I I think I understand the Canadian mentality more being from the Midwest because it's. I think it's a similar mentality of pa- passive aggression because everyone says, "Oh, people from the Midwest are so nice," and I'm like, mm, "They're nice to your face." <laughs> <laughs> like like get a get a couple of old fashions in them, and uh, they'll really you know what they think. <laughs> 
that reminds me of a story when I first moved into my apartment that I live in New York right now. I've lived there with my wife for going on nine years. And we kind of when we first moved in, I get a knock on the door one day. I'm practicing. It's like seven at night. And I'm like, uh-oh, here we go. And it's my downstairs neighbor, and she's this older lady. And she was like, hi, um, we were wondering when your wife is going to get home. Cause like, we like hearing you play, but we like hearing her play the piano a lot more. And I was like, Oh, that's not at all what Ouch. I expected. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, I'll tell her to practice more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so St. Catharines, Ontario, mm-hmm. the garden city. <laughs> I looked up some pictures of this place and it looks like a little fairy tale land to grow up in. I mean, of course, all the photos on Google are are probably the best photos, but it looks like a beautiful town to grow up in. It's okay. It's okay? It's fine. (laughs) Wow. So we're not going to ask you to be the spokesperson for for your hometown. (laughs) Okay, obviously it was traumatic. Let's skip over that. (laughs) Did you grow up there your whole life? Yep, I lived in the same house my whole childhood, and my parents still live there. And I have four siblings younger than me, and most three of them still live there as well, or nearby. Big sister. <clears throat> yes, that's so if I'm ever really bossy to you in a section, that's why. I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're the you're the responsible one, though. Um, yes. I mean, it, it, it's got to be it's got to be a nice place to grow up. I mean, you're not far from the falls, right? And you're. Uh, it seems nice to me. I guess I guess it's everything. Grass is always greener, no matter where you grow up, right? Yeah, it was great. I'm happy not... I, I prefer living in the bigger city, for sure. And uh, But it was great. I had... You know, my parents are both brass players, and I grew up going to Niagara Symphony concerts. And, Where do they play? <laughs> well, this is a bit embarrassing, but trombone and French horn. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> Except my dad's the trombone player. Yeah, F- Freud would have something to say, huh? Yeah. <laughs> So when did you get into the trombone? How do you, I mean, it sounds like we know how you got into the trombone, you know, through the family and going to concerts, like you just said, but. Well, my dad was actually my high school band teacher as well. Oh, wow. Um, both of my parents taught at the high school where I went. Um, so it wasn't a choice. It Apparently I chose it of my own free will. I was kind of a goody two shoes kid in high school. So it was, it was different for me to sit in the back row. <laughs> And uh, start goof around a little bit. So I think it was good for me and loved it right away. And I always loved music. I grew up going to music camp every summer, Niagara Symphony summer music camp. And then later I worked there in high school and taught there. And music was, I just lucked out and had fantastic choir teachers and music teachers all the way through school. And I took piano lessons and I loved my piano teacher. So it was, I loved sight reading piano music. So I hated practicing, but I would just sit and read through like, Disney piano books for hours. And uh, it was always a fun thing for me. And I never thought about doing it as a career until I had to choose what I wanted to study in university. And I thought, well, I can't think of anything I'd rather spend my time doing. And I really didn't get serious about it until until I did a recital in second year. And that kind of got me hooked because I really practiced for that and actually got a lot better, faster, and uh, loved the experience of being on stage as a soloist and performing. And from then on, I took it a lot more seriously and started setting goals. And before that, it was like my my first year, I went home for Christmas and set my trombone where we kept all the brass instruments under the piano and actually forgot to take it back to school because then I didn't touch it again for the whole Christmas break. <laughs> and my, I, my dad dropped me off back at school. And then this is before cell phones. So it's 10 minutes after he dropped me off, I was like, oh my God, I am a trombone major. <laughs> and he had to drive back to Toronto again and bring me my instrument. Not too uh, bad. Yeah. That's that's Nick style. <laughs> you know, because I, I forgot my trombone to my very first trombone lesson I ever took. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's it happens. Of, well, yeah. It's not always the first thing on your mind. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> Who were you studying with then? At, 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 this is University of Toronto, right? I actually studied with Jeff Hall, who's the bass player. Oh yeah, there sure. In well, our orchestra. it's uh, it's come full circle for you then, huh? Yeah, well, I mainly studied with Jeff and with Gord Wolf. I took lessons on the side, so it was definitely I had to flip a switch when I started 
working with them because we always had this very professional teacher student relationship. And I don't know, I think I was raised to be very respectful to people in that sort of position. And so it was a big change to just go from that. Yeah, I guess just the distance that you have a little bit, like I didn't quite feel comfortable just joking around with them at first to working with them in the orchestra. And now you know a completely different side of them. Exactly. <laughs> were they, did they help facilitate that switch for you? Did they, were they like really great about like, oh, come on, like lighten up a little bit, like we're colleagues now or. Oh, uh, there's really no choice in that brass. Like, oh. you just kind of, <laughs> okay. You're just thrown in right off the bat. They're unabashedly themselves at all times, cracking jokes. And it's really fun. When I joined the ballet, you know, at the time, Ray Mace was the principal trumpet and, you know, I, he was Professor Mace to me. <laughs> so I get to my first day at work and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm very happy to be working with you, Mr. Mace. And the whole brass section just started laughing. They're like, oh, Professor Mace, like making fun of him and all. <laughs> and he was like, you have to call me Ray. <laughs> like <laughs> they will not let up if you don't, if you call me Mr. Mace. So you said you got serious about the trombone your sophomore year of college, were you really aiming for Juilliard or was, were, was there other options or like, how, how did you end up in New York? I really didn't know what schools were out there at all. And I didn't know anything about any schools in the States. When I auditioned for university in the first place, U of T was like, that's gotta be the best school <laughs> I could possibly go to. And and I didn't know any professional trombonists. And I, I remember it got to the point where people were, would be dropping names. So I finally just sat down and went online and made little charts of all the major players so that I could start to remember their names because I had never heard of them or listened to them. And I had this teacher, I took a brass performance class that was only offered one year. It has happened to be my third year at University of Toronto. And it was taught by the former principal horn player of the Canadian Opera Company, Joan Watson. And sadly, she passed away from cancer a few years back now. But it was like, it changed my life, this class with her, because she talked about all the stuff that no one else had, that I hadn't heard anyone else talk about, like goal setting, but not just about practicing, about all areas of your life and making goals really specific. Um, I had a little goal setting session with her and she said, what do you want? Where do you see yourself in five years? What do you want to be doing? And I said, I want to play in an orchestra. And she said, which orchestra? And I said, oh, any that'll take me. Like, I don't care. <laughs> Anywhere. And she said, no, you have to pick a city. Where do you want to work? And so I said, Boston or Toronto? And it came true, you know, and, and she, she had kind of a special story where she played horn in the Victoria Symphony in Western Canada. And she said, I want to play, I'm going to play principal horn in the Toronto Symphony. And everyone said, you're crazy, Joan, there's not going to be any openings there. She said, I don't care. That's what I'm going to do. And she just made that her goal. And she said she had cut out a from a program, she had cut out a list of the names of the horn section and she had it on her fridge, but with her name added. And so I did that before, before the Toronto Symphony audition too. And sure enough, I think there was some situation, someone retired early. I can't remember what the story was, but she ended up auditioning and winning the assistant principal horn job in the Toronto Symphony. And then from there, she went on to become principal horn in the Canadian Opera Company. And so, so yeah, she, she totally failed at her goal then. <laughs> principal. <laughs> well, she played principal sometimes, so <laughs> we'll count it. It's yeah. like we can't take anything she said seriously. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a great powerhouse. And, yeah, no kidding. Uh, wow. Yeah, amazing woman. And so that really inspired me to set some goals that I might not have set, like to say, okay, I want to go to Juilliard. I want to study with Joe Alessi. And then I think if you set a goal that specific and that serious, and then just make sure that everything you do is with that kind of in the back of your mind. Like, is this something that is going to help me eventually reach that goal? Even if it's something really small, you have a much better shot of achieving it, especially because you, if you say, I'm going to Juilliard, if you say, I'm going to win a job in this orchestra, I'm going to run 10 kilometers. Uh, I think you can see yourself doing it rather than just saying, it would be cool to have an orchestra job. I love that. So, I really do. Yeah, that's, that's really, really cool. cool. So did that inspiration... So I'm curious, because you said growing up, 
you were more motivated by just enjoying music, it sounds like, and, and playing and, and the, the actual practicing day to day maybe wasn't your favorite thing. So was there a <laughs> point in school, and I imagine her influence w- was really profound on this, but like, was there a point in school where when you had to face that reality of, okay, this is what I want to do, so I have to find some way to make a consistent work ethic? W- was it the goal setting that really helped you with that? I think so. And also, she was really big on putting a story to what you're playing. And, you know, she would say, okay, it's it's all well and good to judge people on intonation and articulation and sound quality and all these things that we consider important. But she would say the most important thing is the goosebump factor. If you're not giving somebody goosebumps, it doesn't matter. And so I think that also changed how I practiced because I didn't really get for a long time how to put my emotion into music. Like, I think I did it a little bit naturally, but making that the focus really made practicing more fun. And then I think I had a good balance between her and my other teachers to also work on all the the technical stuff. And I don't know, understanding that your, your emotional concept can be more clearly understood by the listeners if it's coming across really clearly. So if you have all that technical stuff under control. Wow. Awesome. And I think the, the other important part of that is that when you're setting those long-term goals, they can change. Like no goal has to be sure. set in stone. So you can set these goals and then you don't have to be locked into them. You can, they can morph as you grow. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So you were in New York, you were there for not, a, not even a full two years, was it? Was not even a full year, actually. That's right. You went to, yeah. you went to San Antonio, right? Yeah. Yeah. The official the official training orchestra of, of Juilliard. Yes. Seems like. <laughs> There's so many. How was that experience down in San Antonio? Oh, it was amazing. And I got that job totally thanks to Mr. Lewis Bremer. Mm-hmm. Love <laughs> Lewis. We were at Music Academy of the West, which was one of the best summers of my life. And Why was it the best summer of your life? Oh, we just had this great section. We had we had such a great time. Who, who um, else was in the section? Uh Landris Bryant on tuba. And then Great Lewis name. Bremer on bass trombone, Paul Jenkins, who's now in um, Nashville, Nashville. Yeah. and um, Doug Rosenthal. Oh, great. oh Dougie, Dougie, <laughs> Dougie. Who doesn't Dougie love Fresh. Doug? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we, we had a lot of fun as a section. And yeah, we had this tradition that when we drove, I don't know if you guys have been to Music Academy, but the place, yes. the So the residence, you drive up that big hill. Which isn't the residence anymore, by the way. Oh, Okay. Well, it just wouldn't be the same then. But it, uh, you drive up this big hill. So we, we would have been out, um, you know, going out after a concert or whatever and or meeting up with one of your compeers, having some fancy, like the fanciest dinner you're ever going to be able to afford. And we would blast this. We had it timed. We would blast this Earth, Wind and Fire live at Velfare song, Fantasy. And we'd oh. all just like sing along in the car and drive up the driveway and then show up where all the students were hanging out and partying and <laughs> yeah, me, keep music, the party going. I think Music Academy, everyone who goes to Music Academy, it's one of the best summers of their life. It's pretty awesome. It's a beautiful place. Yeah. A great program. My, it's like so, honeymoon capital of the, the country. That's what I've the what? been told. The honeymoon capital. Yes. And I, I feel like I know several couples who are still together who started at Music Academy as well. <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. But so Lewis came up to me one day and said, hey, are you sending in a tape to the San Antonio audition? And I said, what's San Antonio? Like, I had never heard of it. (laughs) My U.S. geography was still really. What? You didn't know what San Antonio was? Hey, hold on. It sounds like it sounds like someone has forgotten about the Alamo. Okay. Do you know what the I, Alamo is? No, yeah. I do. Now I'll never forget. Yeah. It's not required in, in, in elementary school in Canada to learn about Texas history. <laughs> we have like 20 years of our own history that we spend a lot of time learning. <laughs> so I really had never heard of even the place. And <laughs> so, That's awesome. so he told me what was going on and I made this tape and I played it for him. And he said, you're going to re-record this, right? <laughs> I said, you're going to do Heldenleben again, right? And Bolero. I was like, okay. (laughs) And so, and then I won the second trombone job based on this uh, taped audition because they had to fill all three spots at once. Oh, so there was no live part. There was no live part. So, wow. And they had just one um, 
set of excerpts for tenor trombone. And so Tony Wise was offered the first trombone spot and I was offered the second trombone spot. And then Lewis won the bass trombone spot. So we all moved to San Antonio and had a great year because we were all new and we all would get there early and warm up together and play excerpts every week and put on recitals. And yeah, I really, I loved my time there. So you got to experience warm weather and amazing Mexican food for the first time. Well, also that was like the first time I'd had real Mexican food, aside from a little bit at Music Academy of the West. Mm-hmm. And did you have barbecue made by Lee Hip? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of course you did. <laughs> Every day that we had a double service, the tuba player Lee Hip would say, like, I think the first couple times I brought my own lunch, and then Lee would just come up to us and be like, all right, here's where we're going to go for lunch today. And I would just kind of, like, put my little bag lunch, <laughs> hide it, and <laughs> he'd take us to some amazing local joint and order us secret things that weren't on the menu. Yeah, I've had Lee Hip barbecue in because uh, he, I don't know if he still does, but he taught at Eastern Music Festival when I was uh, a student there, and he would make barbecue, like, every other weekend, and it was awesome. I liked it a lot. Then from there, you were in San Antonio for what, one year? Just one year. And then I was actually planning to return to finish my master's. And then I took the St. Louis one year audition because Steve Lang had just won Boston and got that. So, and then that turned into three years, which was really where I got my master's degree. <laughs> yeah. Was it uh, so a series of, of one years there? Yes. How was that experience? How was playing in the St. Louis Symphony? How was living in St. Louis? Had you heard of St. Louis? I think by then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, be, I'm, I'm totally kidding. Barely. Yeah. <laughs> um, I loved it. I've, I've just been so lucky. Like, I've just had great colleagues every situation that I've been in and great sections. And I hear these horror stories and I, I know that it can be bad. So I'm so grateful for all the people that I've got to work with. Um, so St. Louis was amazing. So you so say I, it, was a, it was a grad experience. So like, what did you learn most going through that experience um well i remember mark lawrence saying once at music academy when he was coaching us like all that really matters is articulation like right before we went out on stage to play i think Mahler seven he's like just remember all that really matters is articulation so st louis was like kind of the embodiment of that statement like just learning how to really play in in the back row how to the kind of presence of sound you needed and and just like the edge that you could put on sometimes to make it work and like learning what was enough, what was not enough, what was too much. And just like that section, that whole brass section is so solid. And I would often be playing assistant and the way they set up, it was like a very back row in the middle of the stage with trombones and then trumpets and then right in front of you, a row of French horns. And so it would often be, I'd be playing assistant and I would have Tim Myers playing principal trumpet on my left. I'd have Tom Drake playing principal trumpet on my right. And then I'd have Roger Kaza playing principal horn right in my face. And it was just this little wow. <laughs> trifecta. And I'd, I'd just be like sitting there resting and soaking it all up. I'm surprised. I mean, that's like my least favorite way to set up with the horns right in front of you. And the horns usually hate it too. <laughs> Do they? Yeah, they don't they've, mind? S- they've since changed their setup on okay. stage, actually. Because we used to sit like that in the ballet pit, and it's like it's just like constantly. It feels like fighting all the time. Mm-hmm. Not like personally, but just like yeah. sounds like meeting each other, you know. But like young, young trombone player me loved it. <laughs> of course, yeah. I mean, there there is something exciting when you <laughs> for have the rest of your play. career. No, thank you. But yeah. but yeah, especially Roger Casa playing in your face. He's a he's a monster, you know. Yeah. Um, oh, well, the attention to detail, that was the crazy thing I learned from him. Like, I, even when we were sitting, we were so close, I could read his music sometimes. So I could see, like, all these accents and slurs and pencil markings, and he would get every single little thing. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Do you think, like, when when you think about the this advice from Mark Lawrence about articulation, I lived in San Francisco for four years, and I took a number of lessons with him. He talks about that a lot. And do you think that that really played into the way you play that you learned how to play like you said in St. Louis because of the hall itself because it is a very like reverberant hall right so that like you like the clarity of the note is the mo- most important part of it right it's the hall but it's also just the instrument i think the trombone the tenor trombone in particular and i think mark mark might also have said this but the range you're just you're so mid range it's such a big orchestra and a lot of what you do is just going to be for nothing if you don't have the articulation, making sure that that cuts through the texture 
and his herds. Even something soft, you need that that little pop. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, I prefer to air attack everything. Air attack, yeah. <laughs> the uh, poo attack. The poo. Sorry, the poo attack. Poo. <laughs> Has Nick Nick ever t- t- told you his uh, reverse articulation? <laughs> oh, I, I, I think so. I, actually, I've mastered the reverse articulation. It, it comes from an inner inner quietude and peace, you know. And then ends up <laughs> the opposite. Yeah, of that. yeah exactly. <laughs> Hot. Yeah, hot. 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 Yeah, hot articulation. When in your three-year period in St. Louis did Toronto come open? Well, actually, it came open like near the end of my first year, I think, and because the second drumroll player was announced his retirement. And I actually took the... So in Canada, we, for the most part, still have a national round for most major orchestras. And there's a lot of debate right now as to whether we should keep on a, having that. On a national level, there's a debate or in Toronto? I think it's something that's discussed across the country, but like definitely in our orchestra, it's something that we talk about from time to time. And people How do feel, you feel about it? I like the idea of still having some sort of advantage for national players, but I can see how it's not very efficient when it comes to hiring, so... Well, I mean, how often do they do they, even if they have a really good candidate, um, in the in the national audition, do they still like, oh, let's just be safe and like we'll just auto advance them? In, uh, in the not very audition. often. Like we have a lot of we have a history of hiring at the national round, especially in string positions. Um, our last like if you look over our last ten years, which I have done as part of the orchestra committee, we have we have hired quite regularly at the national rounds and then a lot of time it goes international as well and um, i actually didn't make it to the finals even at the national audition and then i worked my butt off and came back a year later luckily they didn't hire they gave someone a trial it didn't work out and so they went international and um i got to come back and try it again so speaking of goals when when they first announced that audition did your ears just perk up? I mean, was this something you were always envisioning? Yeah. Yeah, I was ready. I wanted to take it, of course. Yeah, I mean, I feel like those auditions, like the ones that you like dream about are the hardest because like it's so easy to get in your own way mentally and just be like, I want this so bad and just, you know, freak out about it. So like, yeah. in, in, well, I mean, I wonder, just, just out of curiosity, do you feel that having that first chance not winning, did that kind of get out all the butterflies and all that stuff and say, okay, now it's time to like, like now I think I, I, I can do this. I think it always helps having experienced something once already Sure. because there's like the unknown just adds a lot to your, yeah, that's why I think people recommend like try to get a picture of what the hall looks like inside. So you're not walking out on stage and seeing it for the first time. It, I think it always helps that it's a little bit familiar. But what really helped was I just got a lot more serious about my mental preparation. And I did the online course offered through the Bulletproof Musician blog with Dr. Noah Kagayama, who's on faculty at Juilliard, I think, mm-hmm. now. Yep. He's a Don Green disciple. And that really was a game changer for me. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what, what specifically were you... If you feel comfortable talking about it, yeah, what, sure. what specifically were you battling and what did this program help you with and how did it help you? Well, I'd been taking Inderall at auditions for a while, but I kind of eventually realized that it doesn't it doesn't help at all if you're not also mentally ready, which I think is one more argument for it. Like it's it's not going to um, be this magic pill that makes you able to play better or even conquers your nerves it just helps with the physical symptoms of them but you still need to be managing that and uh Can you the imagine biggest... if there was a pill that just made you play better that'd be sweet it's a movie with bradley cooper called limitless <laughs> sorry sorry continue <laughs> there's probably pills that will make you feel like you're playing better <laughs> yeah, that's that that's for the for after, after hours, hours behind the patreon <laughs> wall hang <laughs> yeah so for me, one big thing was just changing my self-talk from being sabotaging to being helpful <laughs> and just like realizing that because especially especially after Juilliard, I was so self-critical and you think you're doing what you're supposed to do when you're saying, 
nope, that wasn't good enough. No, that wasn't good enough. That sucked. That sucked. That sucked. And trying to get it better and better. But uh, really, you can be actually sabotaging your own improvement and process if you're not. And so my kind of golden rule is like, don't say anything. I, you know, I still break it all the time, but try not to say anything to yourself that you wouldn't say to a friend or a student and just be a good coach to yourself, basically. And I was saying a lot of things that were definitely not things I would say to somebody else. It's really easy, right? It, mm-hmm. it sneaks in before you even realize it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I imagine it was a long process to even like, I imagine the first step is just recognizing when you're doing it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's actually a huge part of it. Like if you've done that, then it gets a lot easier. So besides the mental side, you said you really put a lot of work in. Was it just mainly the mental side or did you change anything in, in your process of just physically preparing? I didn't really change how I practice, but I started playing for more people, mm. getting more feedback, which I think is also a part of the mental sure. side as well. Sure. Try- and I played for violinists and and like anyone that would spend 15 minutes listening to me play excerpts. Right. And you get a lot of interesting, like there's still something that sticks with me that this violinist in St. Louis said about how to phrase through a dotted quarter note in a Mahler 5 excerpt. But that I don't think I've ever heard a trombone player say. So it's interesting the things you get out of that. Well, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's very interesting. I think a lot of, you know, it doesn't matter trombone or any other instrument. I think we tend to play for like instruments. Even if it's not trombone, we tend to play for trumpet players or horn players or tuba players. And they are, even if they're trying to be as objective as possible, there is so much just sympathy, sympathy for the problems that we face. They understand yeah. So it's like, okay, yeah. And they, they maybe mentally let some things slide. Whereas if, totally. if you're playing for a violinist, they're going to be like, why did that, why did that note sound different? I don't understand. Yeah. Why is your, why is your valve so loud every time you push it? Exactly. Like, trombone players never complain about that. Yeah. But, we had a horn yeah. audition and one, it got down to the end and our music director was like, he empties his spit too loud. I can't. Oh, that actually but, drives me nuts. Well, That's the, a big I, I understand. But I was like, I mean, you could also just say, hey, could you empty your spit less less loudly? Like, because it, it's not technically the playing. We're supposed to be judging the playing. But anyhow, yeah, there's all this stuff that comes into play when we play for other people. And that's a good way to kind of exercise the mental aspect, right? And then uh, energy regulation is the other thing. Like, I don't know if energy. you guys have. Yeah. So like one thing that he talks about in this course is everybody has a different energy level that they perform their best at. What's it's, yours? What's, well, I think mine's somewhere in the middle. Like, I don't want to be too chill. I'm not one of those people at auditions that's just, like, got the headphones in and not talking to anybody else. I just want to feel kind of normal. And some people have to get themselves really amped up before they go out. I have to say, I think, I was thinking about um, when I was um, reading a little bit before this interview that I think I've had one interaction with you. It's just a vague memory. But I believe... We were at the same audition once. I I, re- I want to say it was Atlanta. I don't even, have you ever auditioned? Yes, there? yeah. And you had I think we were just you had the warm up room, a warm up room that I was going to have right afterwards. <laughs> and it's one of those things like you remember like a feeling or whatever. And I just remembered you were it was an audition. It's like a very tense atmosphere and you were just the nicest person to me like you were super patient like oh yeah let me get in like you're smiling Eating and that like canadian myth yeah. that, <laughs> that doesn't sound right are you sure it was vanessa <laughs> no but I, it just struck me because you know it's it was such a good attitude and energy to have an audition cool. and I th- I i'm glad was, i was putting that, was that really out cool. <laughs> but it was all gamesmanship you're just trying to get in my head i'm sure i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned, I wanted to circle back a little bit. You mentioned when you left Juilliard, you, you felt so much, you know, self-critique. And is it just the experience of going through a, a high level environment like that and being around just really talented people that kind of fuels that sort of thinking? It, it was that difficult to navigate at times? I think a lot of it was, was Joe's teaching. I mean, I think Joe's like a super caring kind person and i i loved working with him but he gets pretty intense in lessons and uh, you know there's you just i'm pretty good at taking criticism i think like i'm at taking it 
in stride at looking at it as something constructive. And, and you could see other people that just like, weren't able to do that so well, but like, even, even with always trying to do that, it, it can be, you can just get really hard on yourself. And then when at the same time you're taking auditions and always trying to figure out what you could have done better, what you could be doing better. It's just, it's a lot. So it took me a while to, you know, and really thanks to good friends and my partner at the time, like having people around you that are going to build you up. I think you need that in your life too. Absolutely. You know, you've, you've had a chance of a relatively rare opportunity to play in three, you know, great ensembles as, as a member. And what did, what do you think that taught you of being able to experience different orchestras, the way they play? Do you like, what did you take away from that experience? Well, I hear people talk a lot about adapting their sound to play in different sections and like, okay, I'm going to audition for this orchestra. I should try to sound in this style. I'm like, Chicago is somewhere that jumps to mind. Like everybody talks about how you have to play this particular way. And I don't know. I think if you're a good musician and you're, you're listening, like you can adapt. It, it's the differences aren't that extreme. Like, I don't think that it's as big of a deal as some people make it out to be to switch around. And there, there are definitely differences to how St. Louis and the Toronto sections played, but I think it's more important that you bring your own sound mm. to that section and bridge, bridge your sound to their sound. Yeah. But you're, you're part of that. So I don't think you should like hide in someone else's idea of what the sound should be. Yeah, I agree. I think when you go and, and take these auditions, like trying to please an entire panel, like really trying to get in their head, like, okay, what do they want? I think it's a little bit of a, a fool's errand because first of all, even if you think you know what they want, you don't really know what they're looking for. So I think it's more important to be yourself, like you said, mm -hmm. and just, and bring what you have to say to the table. And hopefully, hopefully that's something that they're interested in buying, you know? Yeah. All right. Got some, got some rapid fire questions for you, Vanessa. You ready? No. You excited? No. No? Okay. <laughs> Advice to your 18 year old self. Other people care about your experience and what you're going through. I love that. Usually people say the opposite of that, don't they? <laughs> really? <laughs> you just ruined her. No, no, no. I, 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 like, I like that because most people say the opposite. Like, no one cares about what you think. Like, and it, like <laughs> people are negative Nancys, you know? Um, That's just you, Nick. Maybe I'm a negative Nancy. No, I'm just saying no one cares what you think. That's true. <laughs> um, number two. <laughs> Uh, favorite, this is a new one, Nick, um, mm. favorite method or etude book. Oh God, I hate studies, but I have to pick one. <laughs> There's one, there isn't one that you don't hate. Like if you had to go to an Island and bring your trombone, you only get one book to bring. I don't know. I'd probably like make my own and pick oh, and look at you. What about a sassy okay? one like Bootree or like Beesh? I like what the beach etudes, sure. I like the flaws of it. I don't know. I <laughs> Okay. I'm not a big you know how I don't like practicing? I I also don't like studies, but I What a what a show off answer though, like, oh I'll just make my own book. Well not that I would write my own studies, that I would just take like one from sure. this book and one from that book and so, kind of pick like... and choose. I couldn't live with just one. So like the Voxman. The Voxman is a compilation of different etude books. You could have, you could have, I would the, use the Voxman for like kindling, like on the island to like. Oh, I'm not, I'm not the saying the Voxman warm. is good. I'm saying that we could have the Frelick now, which is a compilation of oh. etudes that she likes. Talk have about, you guys ever been like given a, a box of music by like some weekend warrior who finally is, is decided they're never going to look at all that music again? No. More or less. Oh, that happens to me all the time. People just give me like a whole box of. <laughs> Maybe you know what it is. <laughs> There's some really bad stuff in there. You know what it is. You put out into the world that you hate etudes, <laughs> and so the world gives you etudes. <laughs> like I've got this pile to sort right here of like, like super oh my old. God. That I still haven't got through. I just keep moving around with it to different apartments. <laughs> 
let's just have a big giveaway on the trombone retreat instagram and vanessa will autograph each one yeah really... what do you think and sure encircle your favorite etude from each book meaning that yeah. you actually have to go through it <laughs> <laughs> that would be and good sh- for me actually <laughs> You just didn't think a very good person to ask it to. It was a great question. No, but your 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 thoughts and opinions matter. Remember? Yeah. Favorite musical experience or most meaningful musical experience <sighs> that sticks out? Oh, I feel like they're all meaningful. Oh, they're not all meaningful. Some of them really like for a requiem. Say, I was literally just gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I was at Juilliard, I got to play Mahler 5 at Carnegie Hall. That was a pretty big moment. You know, anytime I get to play with my dad, feels really Aww. cool. Like, he played on my that recital that really um, was a game changer for me in second year. I got together this, like, all-star trombone quartet that, like, my dad was on. Awesome. And- <laughs> That's so cool. Um, like, the best tr- bass trombone guy in school. And it was, like... You know, probably one of my most memorable musical experiences of my career was recording the Fleur de Lis Quartet album with with the St. Louis Trombone Quartet. That was that was something I'm really proud of and probably the most in shape I've ever been in my life. Also. Right. You can't hide in a quartet. That's some heavy stuff. And you got you guys have a Canadian trombone quartet now, right? Yeah. The Canadian Trombone Quartet is its name. Um <laughs> Wait, wait, how'd you come up with it? <laughs> well, Actually, based so on it's, what it's all uh, female trombonists, and so we went through a bunch of like really inappropriate female themes. You don't want to call it the female Canadian trombone quartet. You know, never mind. I can't say. It. <laughs> um, and then we're like, why not just call? <laughs> I can't even remember all all of the inappropriate names we came up with. We had a we had one night. We're trying like trying to pick a name for a group or a CD is just the hardest thing I find. But uh, we are like, well, it's just, there's not a Canadian trombone quartet. Let's just be the Canadian trombone quartet. And we won't mention that we're all women. And that Doesn't won't matter. be the focal point. Who, who's in the, who's in the exactly. whole group? Uh, Megan Hodge, Hilary Sims, and Isabel Lavoie on bass. Mm, great. Um, so we had one recital uh, in January of 2020. And we've now <laughs> t- taken a break. <laughs> well, I, I look forward to some recordings. Yeah. yeah. Another another new question. I wrote this down after a lot of drinks one night when I was being very introspective. I'm like, I want to ask every guest this, and I didn't remember it until this morning. So, Vanessa, what does success mean to you? Well, I think for me personally, like the word content comes to mind, like just getting to a place where where I feel content with like where I am on my journey. So not that I'm where I want to be, but just being okay with where I am at with my journey as it pertains to trombone, my personal life, my other life goals. That would, I think I'd feel pretty successful if if that were the case. Is it the case? Getting there. Awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Content, content in the process. I like it. That's that's all we can hope for. Mm Mm-hmm. What is something that trombonists in particular don't do enough of and can do more of? Trombonists in particular? I don't know. We're pretty perfect creatures. You should be a politician, Vanessa. Every question we ask you is just like, everybody's great. <laughs> I don't Exercise? <laughs> That's a new one. I, don't, I think physical fitness is pretty important to playing the trombone. And a lot of people sideline that because like i gotta get one more hour practice it's like maybe just go do some yoga or go for a run and i think it'll help your playing and your mental game as much as another hour of practice that's a new one i liked it have you been finding ways to do it during the pandemic cross-country skiing i actually just issued a february uh running challenge to well just on facebook but and then i had such a great response that i started a private group and so people have just been the goal is to do four runs or walks a week and post a like either a picture from your running app or a selfie of you doing it and everyone gives each other kudos we've got some other trombone players on there Um, donna parks is on there chris van hoff is on there so have you heard of uh uh, there's like these um i don't want to say negative accountability 
apps, but it, it, it sort of is. I have colleagues who do this for um, different things like meditation or yoga or running or things like that, where you, where you have an accountability partner. But what you do when you sign up is you sign up for causes or charities that you hate and would never want to donate to. <laughs> and if you don't meet your goals, you have, you, you, you put in like 50 bucks and oh, that money man. goes to like, so my friend chose uh, Donald Trump when it, for, for president uh, fund. And back, this was like in 2017. And yeah, so of course he never missed his, missed his goals. Yeah. That would be a great motivator yeah. for sure. It, it comes from a, a positive and negative place. Very interesting. Actually, but like that accountability thing brings up a good point because I've actually wished over the years that brass players get to have a coach like vocalists do. Like singers have coaches their entire careers and they're uh, even just like their piano players act as coaches to them from what I understand. I don't know a lot about it. My wife is a vocal coach originally. Yeah. Why don't we have more brass coaches? Like I've I've gone through some some playing issues in the past few years, and there were there were times where practicing was such a slog because it just didn't sound how I wanted it to sound, didn't feel great. And at those times, I just I've wished that there was like a somebody I could hire to just keep me accountable in my practicing. And Seriously, that's I a, mean, why not? I, I thought about that too. Yeah, it, it, like what if like someone could say. Like Vanessa Frelick going to come in and be like, okay, today we're going to work out of this book, this book, this book. We're going to do this for 10 minutes, this for 10 minutes, blah, blah, blah. And just like plan out everything for you. Yeah. And maybe you have to submit recordings to you or like. I think it's like a so field effective. that nobody's like, it's it's just a job for somebody that's that's waiting. And well, even just motivation. Right. Like of course. it's kind of crazy that we're all out here on our own just trying to motivate ourselves to to do this every day and you're not always sure if you're doing it right. And especially during COVID, like there should be, there should be somebody filling this, this gap, I think. Well, I think you have to change the culture, right? Like the culture is like of musicians being like, well, I'm a professional. Why would I need to go get like more training or like accountability or anything like that? But if you change it where like it becomes like the norm, like it is for singers, then then yeah. th- then it's like okay like well it's like i'm working on this i'm having some trouble let me go check in with x y and z you know but i think of it it's more of a feeling of like i should be ready like i'm done school okay i should be able to do this on my own not like an ego thing or it's like i can do this on my own i think actually most people just are like i think i'm supposed to be right ready to be sure. a professional and if there was more of a constant like no you still it's okay to still need coaching to still need some help getting motivated staying focused checking in that would be so helpful for a lot of people's careers i think i agree in that regard vanessa we would definitely like to officially invite you to the trombone retreat practice hang which happens monday through friday for an hour where we just we just basically it's actually happening in about 20 minutes we just get on zoom and put it on mute and a bunch of people show up and we, we just chat, but we're all practicing the whole time. And it's <laughs> for Nick and I, it's been awesome. That's I mean, cool. it's, it's been really fun. So I'm going to show up for it. Sounds great. And if, yeah, if people are having specific issues or like, Hey, how do you work on double tonguing scales or how do you work on X, Y, or Z? I think it's been helpful for students and professionals alike. We, we've had a, a number of professionals show up. It's been fun. So yeah, that sounds great. join us sometime. So you were invited. Thanks. Everybody's invited. Do you hear that, everybody? Vanessa's going to be there every day. <laughs> so please come and you can see Vanessa practice her etudes that she loves. So maybe, much. yeah, you can, maybe you can practice while cross country skiing. <laughs> Bring a P bone or something. That would get. <laughs> I'll pass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that sounds well, difficult. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, thanks for hanging out with us, Vanessa. Um, yeah, it's good to see me. you at least. Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. It's it's good to see you virtually at least, and hopefully we'll get to hang out in person sometime and actually play the trombone together at some point. But best of luck with everything going on and bigger and brighter ahead. Yeah, yeah, maybe hope so may, for all of us. Maybe we can go skiing again in Utah at some point. Oh, the powder! Yeah, <laughs> fresh pow pow. It's so good. Yeah, all of our. I think we're like the only place in the world ski hills are are closed down. You can't even go. Can't even go skiing because of COVID on the little hills that we do have. Oh. 
But you have Tim Hortons, though. Ugh. <laughs> I you despise know, Tim Hortons. What? You know, no, did you know another fun fact about St. Catharines, Ontario? Is the place Tim Horton died. You mean when he was drunk driving and crashed his car? Yeah, he's a horrible person that there should not be a chain of restaurants named after. Oh, man. Oh, we saved the juicy stuff for the closing. <laughs> I love it. Wow, I, yeah. I didn't realize Tim Hortons was a trigger for Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. know anything about him other than he was like a hockey player at one point. Yeah, apparently he was not such a great guy. And he was drunk driving when he died. Which is not See, now, do they call it drunk driving Canada or is it drink driving? Because it, it's it, different English speaking countries call it different things. You guys have different <laughs> words for things than we do? I think as far as drinking is concerned, we just keep it simple. Because in, in England and Australia, they do say drink driving. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh. I don't even know that. Wow. Yeah. Thanks, Nick, now you know. for that so, nugget of wisdom. Well, you know what, Sebastian? All right. You can go back to Texas, all right, and remember your freaking album. Oh, man. I, <laughs> at least someone does. <laughs> I, I did the tour. <laughs> it's not really that awesome. Okay. Davy Crockett's rolling over in his grave. <laughs> I was a uh, you know, loyalist. I come from loyalist background. Ah. Another fun fact about St. Catherine's Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> today it's it was one of the final settled is it really yes. is that what you were gonna say well her, her church it, it, was right around the corner from my house no kidding that's very cool and also it was one of the final stops on the underground railroad makes sense cool. if she was there yeah that's where she brought her parents to yeah get get out of america that's probably a good idea mm -hmm. but then she went back to new york Oh. Well, she had so, her young uh, young boyfriend she had to get back to oh my Man, you are just full of history <laughs> i love it Random, random thing. Me, me too. Yeah, Harry too. Tubman should be on the the twenty dollar bill or whatever they're about to replace. Uh, I just want more sure. Freyla hot takes. <laughs> yeah, I'm all for it. Cool, you hear, heard it here. <laughs> all right. Well, if you ever need any other facts about your hometown, just let me know. Okay. Can you give me one more? Oh just man. To end the call. Oh. Oh jeez. <laughs> I was like maxed out. <laughs> You were bluffing. It is the it is I was. The I totally <laughs> was. I'm gonna put this on Wikipedia. It's the birthplace of Vanessa Freelich. <laughs> Fun fact. Well, I did it does have like significant people born there and you were not Oh, Neil Pert. Oh. That's one, he of, was born one there? of the big guys. I remember I believe so. Oh. I believe I read that. I think it was the first city or in North America to have streetcars. Whoa. Maybe. Well or fourth city. <laughs> I I imagine it was <laughs> first or fourth. Now we're just making stuff up. <laughs> they also invented oatmeal. I don't know if you knew. The steel cup. <laughs> steel. I, I, I imagine, just on a side note, that it was also one of the first cities in North America to have electricity because of the falls. Because Buffalo was like the first like fully electric city, right? Maybe. It was booming. It was, it was boom. boomtown. I'm sure it was. It's okay. also spelled with two A's. Catharines. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll let you guys. It's <laughs> the longest goodbye ever. Good luck. Good luck in your uh, committee stuff. That's tough business. I I was on the committee for yeah. a while. Yeah, I'm on the I'm the chair of the artistic committee right now. It's... Oh, you're just like more trombone concertos, guys. Yeah. Yeah, they don't. It's kind of ironic that the trombonist is the chair of the artistic committee. Really. Yeah, I would say it's perfect. Yeah. I'll try. What you have to say is valuable, Vanessa. <laughs> Thank you. I needed to hear that, <laughs> like, 20 years ago. Where were you, Sebastian? Where were you? <laughs> well, I think we cleared something up, Sebastian. You know what it is? What? Frelick, not frolic. Yeah, I mean, I could see, because frolic sounds more, I imagine it's a German word. I forgot to ask. But oh. if it's German, I would think it's frolic. You're better, better. It's very good. Yeah. Very good. That BV sound that they get in Spanish. Yeah, good chat. I was, it was I enjoyed it, and I, I, I've always enjoyed Vanessa. I've known her for a while, and she's uh, a model of success. Yeah, she has a, a kick-ass resume, and she's, she's just really applied herself. And she's just a fantastic player, obviously. Definitely check her out. There's some good recordings on YouTube. And, of course, that, that St. Louis uh, recording is really, really awesome. But I really liked what she was talking about. You know, growing up, she, she just followed loving music. But 
being inspired by that great teacher to to really set goals and set specific goals, I thought it was really interesting. And it kind of goes along the lines of believing something is possible. Like when she was talking about writing her name on the roster of the Toronto Symphony before the audition, it's like a way to really go a step further than visualization and just accept that it's a possibility. And in a way, it like kind of takes away nerves, right? Yeah, it's like the truest essence of what a vision board is. You know, it's like <laughs> if you boil yeah. that down to its essence, uh, that that's what she did, and it, it was. Uh, it's pretty cool that she has that story. You know. Yeah, and you would think, you know, you could look at it a couple of different ways because we worry about oh, if we make such a specific goal and we don't reach it, is that setting us up for being really disappointed? And I don't think she necessarily looks at it that way, but it's just really helps. I think she would be happy if she wasn't in the Toronto Symphony Orchestra and still won another job. But I think just believing in, in, in yourself that much, I think it is really cool and a really focused way of doing it. I think that's really interesting. Me personally, and, and you, you had some really good ideas about tiered goals, you know, looking at goals as like a step to another goal to a step to another goal. Yeah, there's. Uh, I was going to mention that Nikki Abyssi turned me on to something called SMART Goals. And it's not her thing. She just uh, hit me to it. And it's, it's an acronym. It's specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. So if you take, take each one of those, you know, say like, I want to, within a year, be able to play the row parts or something like that, you know? And so then you go from there and you, and you have uh, checkpoints along the way to that goal. And um, you make sure it's a goal that's achievable from where you are right now in your playing. And, and then the time based obviously is, you know, you set a t time frame. I think it's a, you know, it's a smart way of going, a smart way of going about things. And I, <laughs> hey. I've tried, I've tried to uh, implement this with my students, even, even using the, using the acronym itself or just the idea of it and having students not just say, Oh, be better at the trombone. Well, that's not specific enough. You know, we have specific goals that you want to reach like Vanessa. I want to play trombone in Boston or Toronto. Hey, look, she did it. So it's pretty cool. That's cool. Yeah, somewhat related, the way I kind of look at goals is is a slightly different thing. I was really inspired by this article I read once, and I can definitely dig it up for anyone that's curious. But it's less about having a specific goal and more about, and this is in line with kind of how I feel about, you know, meditation and trying to be present in everything you do. And it's more about having a system. And it's more about the things you do every day and building something as part of your identity that if you just try to accomplish all these things every day, these results are going to come. And of course, kind of have a, a target or a, something you're aiming towards, but like things like knowing the things that always make you feel good and help you improve. Like, okay, I know my system is going to include, I'm going to work out for 30 minutes a day. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to eat at this specific time. I'm going to warm up at this specific time. I'm going to record myself. I'm going to like, build your own system and just make that a repeatable thing that you, that just becomes part of your identity and only good things come from that. Yeah. I mean, you, one could call that a routine, but it's kind of like a life routine rather than just a trombone routine. Yeah. So something else that she, she brought up that I think we all definitely identify with, especially us that have spent a significant amount of time in New York city is dealing with neighbors and trombone players uh, turns out it's not the quietest instrument. What? And <laughs> there's things that we have to practice sometimes that are loud. And neighbors don't always love it, unfortunately. And a lot of people have, who have been through situations like this can identify, but it's such a nuanced thing. It, it comes down to person to person, of course, but there's ways that you can at least try to minimize these altercations, I found. I mean, ha have you had direct experiences like this? Um, you know, though, I've been pretty lucky, but my first apartment in New York, I was living with Kyle Covington, who's principal trombonist in the San Diego Symphony. Shout out to Kyle, one of my really close friends. And we, we generally practiced at school because we were walking distance to school. But sometimes, like for various reasons, we practice at home, but very rarely. And every single time we did, it would be during the week 
and it would be during normal hours, you know, two in the afternoon or something like that. And every time this guy who was across the air shaft from us would come and knock on our door and say, you know, I work nights. Can you keep it down? And so we'd put in a practice mute. This went on for a year and a half. And one time he comes over, knocks on the door and we put in a practice. I put in a practice mute and he comes back. There's a knock on the door, like two minutes later. And I was like, what now? There's no way he can hear me. I'm, I have a practice mute. And I open the door and he has a CD and he says, you know, I feel really bad. Um, I'm always bothering you because you're bothering me. And I just like, I kind of want to give you this as a olive branch, you know, say that I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just sensitive. And it was a Bob Brookmeyer CD. Wow. I was, like, I was like, how do you know Bob Brookmeyer? And he goes, well, actually I'm, I make a living as a jazz guitarist. What? And so this backfired on him. And I said, you of all people have to know that I have to practice. Like, that's unbelievable that you'd come. I didn't know you were a musician. And I said, we don't have the uh, benefit of unplugging our instrument like you do. And you can just play quietly. You don't have to be amplified or you could wear headphones. And I said, do me a favor. Don't come back here anymore. And one time I was, you practicing. said that. Yeah. And, uh, and so one, one afternoon he comes and knocks on the door. I looked at the people and I said, I'm not stopping. I have, I have my right to practice. And he said, well, then I'm calling the cops. And I said, go ahead. They're not going to come. I mean, a noise, a noise complaint at two in the afternoon. They're not going to show up for that because it's within your rights. So that leads me to know your rights. You know, the, the cities, most cities, at least in North America have, um, tenant rights and they protect musicians what they call reasonable noises during these hours. And some buildings have specific, like if you're in a co-op or something like that, have specific rules that are unique to that building. But generally the city or the state has, have rules that protect you, laws that protect you, not just rules. Yeah. And that's, and obviously you don't want it to have to come to that, but you want to, you want to know what you have in your corner. And in my opinion, the best thing you could do is kind of be direct with it. and. If you move to a new place or if you have a new neighbor, knock on the door, introduce yourself, show that you're a human and just be like, hey, I'm a professional musician and I, you know, I have to practice for my job and just let me know if it's ever too much. And just sometimes just saying that just humanizes yourself a little bit and and makes them a little bit more understanding. And there's always ways you can compromise and if you get to know like their work schedule, you know, you could be lucky in, in certain things. And there's of course, you know, you could talk about things you can do acoustically to to treat your walls or floors. Often, you know, lower sounds penetrate walls more so and they often go vertically in buildings rather than to the sides like a lot of people think. So putting down rugs helps a lot. But it ma- it makes me think of a story once with when I was living with my ex girlfriend in New York City. One time the neighbor came and knocked on the door and we opened the door and you're always a little nervous when you don't recognize the person. And they're like, she, my, my ex-girlfriend was a pianist and she knocked on the door and she was like, are you, are you the pianist? Are you the one that that's practicing all the time? And she, and we were, we were like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry if it's, if it's loud. And she's like, she pulls a bottle of wine from <laughs> behind her back and she's just like, I just want you to know that me and my family listen to you every night and it's just so beautiful. Oh, which was like amazing. It was just like one of those amazing New York moments. And of course, you're like, no one would ever bring me a bottle of wine for playing trombone. No. <laughs> well, I, I once was uh, practicing the off Clyde. I know this is a trombone podcast, but I do every now and then play the off Clyde and trombone that, adjacent. It's, it's yeah, it's like the the black sheep of the brass family. So I was practicing it and there's a knock on the door. It's probably like seven at night and I'm like, Oh, here we go. But like also like the off Clyde's not very loud. So I was like, who's, who's complaining about the off Clyde besides Sarah? It's a terrible instrument besides that. And this woman, she says, um, I have a weird question for you. Um, I'm in a photography class and my assignment for the week is to take a picture of a neighbor in their home environment. Can I take pictures of you practicing? 
And you started taking your clothes off. <laughs> I was sure. like, I was like, I know this routine. Button, button, <laughs> button. Yeah, Cinemax. Hit me like one of your French girls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I didn't want her to take pictures of me with off clad. So I put that down and pulled out my trombone. And she took pictures. And a couple weeks later, she developed them professionally. And I still have some of them. They're really cool. So, uh, they, they, she did them both in color and in black and white. And that was also a great New York neighbor moment. But Unfortunately, I know too many people that have had just horrible experiences and have had to move like Vanessa said she had to move, you know, just because it becomes unbearable, you know. It would have been really cool to have some weird headshots of you holding an awful Clyde. Yeah, in retrospect, I probably should have done it, you know. It'd be very like um kind of steampunk. Cool. Yeah. Like Williamsburg. <laughs> <laughs> I just so what do you do for a living? I play the Alpha Clyde yeah. in a spoken word trio. <laughs> you yeah, can see us at the coffee shop. It's the it's a jaw harp, an Alpha Clyde, <laughs> in a dulcimer. <laughs> <laughs> we play seventies Christian contemporary music. <laughs> I love it. The dude. Ironic. Oh man. I kind of want to do that now. I, I've always had like an idea of having like a, a genre s- wheel spinner. Like you just spin the wheel and it'll just match up with like a random genre of music and a random like, instrumentation and you just create that band. Ooh, the hurdy gurdy. It's always a good one. <laughs> Nothing. Um, and if you enjoy the hurdy gurdy, and or this podcast, please consider leaving us a rating and review on iTunes. If you want to leave a question or a topic you'd like us to discuss, we'll answer it on the podcast. Follow us at Trombone Retreat on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and our website, TromboneRetreat.com, where you can also join our mailing list. Also, subscribe to our new YouTube channel. We're also now offering online trombone lessons. So visit TromboneRetreat.com slash lessons for more information. And feel free to shoot us an email at tromboneretreat at gmail.com as we love hearing from you. Thank you so much to everyone that has been reaching out. We get so many emails each week and it just, it really, it really makes our day to, to wake up to these. On Instagram, follow Nick at bassdrombone444 and myself at js.vera. And as always, never forget, retreat yourself. Please stand clear of the doors. Station. Don't ask. Don't ask station.